The latest effort to halt fighting in Gaza and free the remaining hostages has failed. Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu rejected the latest proposal from Hamas, calling it, quote, delusional. He said the war will continue, that his country is on its way to absolute victory. CBS News foreign correspondent Deborah Petta has more. As war rages on, a hostage deal so often seems like a mirage. Secretary of State Antony Blinken tried to sound upbeat. While there are some clear non-starters in Hamas's response, uh, we do think it creates space for agreement to be reached. But after five visits to this region, he's going home empty-handed. Israeli leader Benjamin Netanyahu has rejected the Hamas proposal as delusional. And he's directed Israeli troops to advance on Rafa, the last remaining refuge for displaced Palestinians. Total victory over Hamas will not take years. It will take months. A vow that directly contradicts Blinken's goals of reducing hostilities and allowing humanitarian aid into Gaza. Netanyahu has also enraged some former hostages, campaigning to bring the estimated 101 captives back home. If you continue on this path to eliminate Hamas, Adina Moshe said, there will be no more hostages to release. Deborah Pater, Jerusalem. Bring in Senior Vice President of Global Operations at the Sufan Group, uh, Christopher O'Leary. He's the former Director of Hostage Rescue and Recovery for the U.S. government and the former counterterrorism senior executive for the FBI. Uh, so the, the strategy seems to be uh, to try and continue to press the war effort until the hostages are released. But is there another path perhaps available, given that there was some diplomatic solutions or even diplomacy that was offered uh, in the uh, weeks previous that did bring some of those hostages home? Well, good morning, and uh, simple answer is yes. Uh, the package that's being offered is actually originates from an Egyptian uh, package that was structured months ago, uh, which was really a, th a three-phase package that both the Qataris and the Egyptians have been pushing forward uh, with the support of the uh, Director Burns from the CIA and the, the Mossad leader, um, and trying to get to a phase solution to this. Yes, Hamas would like to have a long-term ceasefire and... Uh, a cessation of hostilities completely because they want to survive this. But that is in friction with Netanyahu's uh, desire to uh, crush Hamas, destroy them, because there's domestic call for that within Israel. Um, yes, there's sympathy for the hostages, but more Israelis really want, want to uh, eradicate Hamas. So Secretary Blinken said yesterday that he thinks Hamas's proposal creates what he called space for an agreement to be reached. And you talked about a phased solution. So if what Hamas has put forward would be phase one, and the ultimate goal is to end this war, um, how would the other phases look? What would they look like based on your expertise? Well, I will tell you, and I have some uh, direct knowledge of these negotiations. Phase one is very similar to what we, we did uh, just a few months ago, mm -hmm. which would be releasing their remaining women and children and the elderly, perhaps uh, anybody that's wounded, although that has not been clarified yet, uh, which includes one American, by the way, uh, who was wounded, you know, in uh, Hirsch uh, Goldberg, Poland. Um, you know, he's been widely reported on. So the goal is to try to get those out uh, and release the uh, Palestinian prisoners who do not have blood on their hands. But getting to the next phases after that is very difficult. For both sides, number one, the members of the Israeli Defense Forces that Hamas is holding have great value and great leverage for them. And then on the other hand, who uh, the Israelis do not want to release are actual convicted terrorists who have blood on their hands from both Hamas and Palestinian Islamic Jihad and the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine. Uh, these, these are real hardcore terrorists who nobody uh, in Israel wants to see them back on, on the street. Maybe you can help uh, our audience understand something. Uh, and Emery and I have been talking about this too. Um, ha Hamas is is generally funded uh, by Iran. Uh, Iran uh, Iranians, uh, for the majority, are, are Shias. Uh, what is the interest of 
the Qataris, uh, the Saudis, who are primarily Sunnis. And I know I'm getting into a religious discussion here, but but it, it would strike me that uh, there would be more of a of a role for Iran to play, even as heated as uh, Iran and Israel have been over the years. In other words, they're 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 sort of mortal enemies. But but I, I I'm trying to understand. What the Qataris are are trying to do here, and what their role is in shaping this discussion, because as you know, Blinken's on his way uh, back to Washington. Uh, he had just returned from the Middle East. Uh, it was his fifth visit, and we're sort of feeling like it's starting to feel as if we're just sort of on a hamster wheel. And, and I will say, it seems like the Qataris have been the most successful when it comes to these diplomatic so far, efforts. So far, yeah. but I wonder what even the relationship between Hamas and and the Qataris are. So I think Anne Marie kind of hits on it. Number one. The Qataris see themselves as, uh, you know, critical in conflict resolution around the world. And you can actually trace it back to their Bedouin roots. So in the desert, you would make friends with your neighbors in the region because you might not be able to survive on your own. Hmm. And they have a tradition of conflict resolution in their culture. With Iran, Iran uses Hamas and their other proxies and affiliates um, as utility players. It gives them defense and depth gives them the ability to uh, asymmetrically go after the West, put pressure. Qatar Hezbollah is a great example of that. Uh, but, you know, this is really protecting the Persian kingdom by having forward deployed proxies who can be irritants against U.S. interests and Western interests, but they don't have to get directly involved. And they've done so successfully. And that's what we're seeing right now. That's why our response is uh, not against Iran, it's against Qatar Hezbollah, because there is some distance that Iran puts uh, away from these, you know, the mess of these problems. So, Christopher, does that mean then that Iran sees these proxies as expendable? Because when the United States says, you know, we're going to strike back at uh, 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 Iran, Iranian funded groups that are proxies that are attacking, for example, our interest in the Red Sea, as long as we don't attack Tehran, things seem to be sort of copacetic and the status quo. I think uh, that's a very good point, and I think it's accurate. But there are some differentiations. The Houthis are certainly a little more expendable uh, than, say, Lebanese Hezbollah, who is very tight uh, with the Iranian regime, with Al-Quds force. Uh, Qatab Hezbollah a little more so as well, because it was creation of Qasem Soleimani. Um, but Hamas is, as you indicated, a Sunni nationalistic terrorist organization that is really not aligned with the IRGC and the Iranian regime at all. All right, Christopher O'Leary, great conversation. Thank you so much.